Well, if you take a tangent and then an inverse tangent, you get back to the original variable. So now we have to take the inverse tangent of 0.68, which is uh, approximately 34 degrees, rounding off. 34 degrees. So now we know that this angle is 34 degrees. And that's a good way now of describing the direction of our resultant displacement vector. Um, our resultant displacement of the two different portions of the path is a magnitude of 6.9 me meters from where we started in a direction uh, that's 34 degrees um, to the left of the vertical here. 34 degrees to the left of the vertical, magnitude of 6.9. So now we've completely taken the components and described the overall vector. Uh, remember, that's one of the other skills that we've learned, how to go from right to left here. Take the components and figure out the overall vector. Remember that you can use the Pythagorean theorem to take the two components and figure out the magnitude of the overall vector. And then you can use tangent and inverse tangent to take the components and figure out the direction represented by the angle of the overall vector. Let me remind you one more time uh, that usually when you form a tangent, you're normally going to be putting the vertical component over the horizontal component. But it doesn't always work that way. In this problem, we ended up putting the horizontal component over the vertical component. So again, um, don't assume that you're always going to put the vertical component on the top of the tangent fraction, even though it usually works that way. On this problem, we put the horizontal component 3.9 on the top and the vertical component on the bottom. The only thing you know for sure is that the tangent is toe. It's always the opposite over the adjacent. So I worked out um, that the uh, angle that the resultant vector was forming was 34 degrees with the vertical. Uh, if you tried this problem successfully on your own, I think maybe a lot of people might have actually found the angle at the horizontal. A lot of people might have ended up finding this angle at the horizontal. Well, that's perfectly okay. Uh, we know there's always a bunch of different angles you can find. I guess this angle would have been approximately 56 degrees. So it's totally okay if you ended up finding this angle instead. Uh, maybe a lot of you made this right triangle. It's totally okay if you made this right triangle. Probably a lot of you, when you were writing down the overall resultant vector, maybe most of you wrote down this right triangle. Instead of putting the, the triangle on top of the overall vector, maybe a lot of you put the triangle on the bottom of the overall vector. Maybe this seems a little bit more natural, actually. Uh, that's perfectly okay. You should still have gotten the same answers. You should still have gotten that the overall resultant vector was 6.9, um, but you would get a different angle because now you would be focusing on the angle at the horizontal. And so you would have gotten 56 degrees, not 34 degrees. So if you made this right triangle and you got 56 degrees, that's perfectly fine. Um, you can either say that we're making an angle of 34 degrees with the vertical or 56 degrees with the horizontal. It just depends on which right triangle you chose to draw. Um, originally, I draw, drew the right triangle above the overall uh, resultant vector, um, but maybe it would have been more natural to draw the right triangle below the resultant vector. Either way, it can give you the right answer. Okay, so this kind of summarizes what we've done in this problem. Originally, I told you that somebody walked for 6 meters at an angle of 20 degrees above the horizontal, and then 4 meters at an angle of 25 degrees to the left of the vertical, and I asked you to find this overall displacement vector. And now we've been able to do it. We found that the overall displacement vector is 6.9 meters in length, uh, and it's pointing in a direction 34 degrees to the right of the vertical. Or if you wanted to, you could say that it was, uh, what did we get? Um, 56 degrees above the horizontal. I'm not going to show that angle because it would make the diagram a little bit messier, but you could also have said that it was an angle of 56 degrees above the horizontal. All right, uh, and again, the point I want to make is that this was not an easy problem. Uh, it's not really obvious how you can combine 6 and 4 and get 6.9, and it's certainly not obvious how we can combine the 20 and the 25 and get the 34. So again, I just one more time want to uh, call your attention to the fact that this is a very clever trick. 
breaking an overall vector into components um, really simplifies uh, this problem of combining these two uh, vectors here that are not parallel to each other. And then, of course, if you're going to do that, it would be nice at the end to be able to take the components and build back up the overall vector. And we've learned how to do that as well. Uh, so if this problem gave you difficulty, it would be good to go back and do the question again. So we're pretty much at the end now of this series of videos on um, how to break vectors into components and how to build the components back up into the overall vector. We've learned about the trigonometry that you need in order to uh, successfully carry out these two operations. Uh, and then we've learned specifically how to take an overall vector and break it into components and how to take the components and build up the overall vector. One of the main issues we've dealt with here is signs. Um, we've learned how to uh, correctly get positive and negative signs on the components. And we've also learned about a little notation that you won't find in your textbook, but that I think is useful. I think it's useful to use a dot when you're referring just to the magnitude of a component um, so that you know that the symbol without the dot refers to the signed component. I think that's a, a type of um, a symbol that, that can be really helpful to a beginning student. So I encourage you to try to use that as your class proceeds. Uh, at the beginning of this series of videos, I also tried to indicate why it's useful to be able to use these two tricks. And now here at the end of the videos, we went back to those two examples. I tried to give you two examples that show how it's useful to break vectors into their components because that allows you to more easily add or combine vectors that are not parallel. Uh, and then at the end of the problem, you want to be able to take the components and build back up the overall vector because usually um, the answer is most intelligible if it's in terms of the overall vector. Here, 6.9 meters in an angle of 34 degrees, say, with the vertical. Now, what can you do with the skills that we just talked about? Well, one thing you can do is now you can add and subtract vectors. So one thing you can do with the skills we've talked about is add and uh, subtract vectors. Again, the only way to add and subtract vectors that are not parallel is first to break them into components. Uh, and once you've broken them into components, you can add and subtract uh, those vectors. I'm not going to specifically cover addition and subtraction of vectors in this series of videos, but you can certainly find plenty of examples of that in your textbook. And certainly for those problems, it's going to be very important to be able to break vectors into components. Uh, but more generally, um, in, this, uh, in your class, you're going to be dealing with lots and lots of vectors. And in most problems, most of the vectors will not be parallel to each other. Uh, well, how can you deal with a problem where you have a lot of vectors that are not parallel to each other? The only way to deal with vectors that are not parallel or anti-parallel to each other is to break all of them down into their components. So this is a skill that you're going to need over and over through um, most of the topics in your physics course. You're going to have to take the overall vectors and break them down into components. It turns out that overall vectors are really not very useful for problem solving. Overall vectors are not very useful for problem solving because you can't combine overall vectors because they're usually not parallel or anti-parallel to each other. Um, so it, much more useful for problem solving is the vector components. It's much easier to combine vector components because all the x components are parallel or anti-parallel and all the y components are parallel. So usually in any problem where you're given overall vectors, one of your first steps is to break the vectors into components. And then when you're done with the problem, at the very last step, you might take the components and build back up an overall vector. So this is, again, a skill you're going to need on many different uh, problems in the course. Again, the idea is anytime you're given a problem with a bunch of overall vectors, usually one of the first things you have to do is break those overall vectors into their components. Um, only when you have the components are you, uh, are you um, only the components are going to be easy to deal with because all the x components will be parallel or anti-parallel to the other x components and all the y components will be parallel or anti-parallel to the other y components. Uh, so the reason that um, I've gotten through a lot of examples in this series of videos is that this is a skill that you really need to have mastery of. Uh, so as usual, I would recommend um, redoing the problems in this series of videos until you feel that you do have that mastery, until you feel these questions are boringly easy for you. So now might be a good time to just go back to the beginning of this series of videos and do this series of videos all over again if you feel that these uh, uh, problems are still difficult for you. If you feel that you've already mastered the material, great. But if you feel you don't have mastery yet, go back and redo lots or all of the problems from this series of videos. And in addition, it would be great to do more practice problems um, from your textbook, say. This is material that you really have to have nailed down because, as I mentioned before, this is not supposed to be the hard part of physics. This is supposed to be the easy part of physics. Uh, and so unless you actually get to the point where you feel these problems are easy, you're not going to be able uh, to deal with the problems that really are more difficult than this. Okay, well, I hope that you uh, found this series of uh, videos helpful, and I hope that you will do the practice that is necessary to really master the techniques uh, that we've introduced in these videos.